This is Floss Weekly, and I'm Jonathan Bennett. Dan Lynch joins me today. We interview Jonathan Steck, a developer from the Endless Sky Project, an open source space exploration video game. You don't want to miss it, so stay tuned. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 625, recorded Wednesday, April 14th, 2021, Endless Sky. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Linode. Simplify your cloud infrastructure and cut your cloud bills in half. Get started on Linode today with $100 in free credit. Text TWIT to 474747 or visit linode.com slash floss and click on the Create Free Account button to get started. And by Technology Powers X. Learn how technology is reshaping business through an original podcast from Dell Technologies. Search for Technology Powers X anywhere you listen to podcasts and download each episode today. Hello, I'm Jonathan Bennett. Welcome to Floss Weekly, uh, the weekly show about all things open source and things that we find interesting. Uh, you might notice I am not Doc Searles. He is out of the, well, out of the continental United States. He, uh, the lucky dog, is out in Hawaii, last I heard. Um, so I got handed the reins of the show for today. And uh, I have Dan Lynch, one of my favorite co-hosts, is here with me. Hey, Dan, how are you today? Hey, Jonathan. Uh, good to see you. I didn't realize that we got sent to Hawaii when we weren't hosting. Someone didn't send me that memo. So, you know, if, if we want to do that, that's all good. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, um, I, I have some back pay, some back vacation time coming, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So, so where, remind us all, where are you speaking to us from? So I am I am across the ocean, uh, not in that direction though. I'm uh, I'm in uh, near Liverpool in the UK, as you may pick up from the uh, the accent. I'm also not Doc Sells. You've probably realised that as well. Um, <laughs> he's not hiding around here anywhere that I know of. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm coming in all the way from uh, across the waves, and uh, it's pretty nice here. It, it's uh, it's spring is starting to uh, to come out, mm-hmm. and we're we're getting a bit warmer. Things are opening up a bit, so it's pretty good. How are you doing? Uh, I am good. I am here in Lawton, Oklahoma, in the what I call the corporate mm. headquarters, which is really just one corner of my home office. Uh, you may notice things if you've if you've watched the show a lot over the last few months. You may notice things look different. Um, I've been very very slowly in the midst of a a project here to rebuild the office and get some better camera hardware and finally have some of that going. So rather than a little webcam that's sitting here, there is a big DSLR sitting up there, and uh, I'm pretty excited mm. about that. I think it looks a lot better. Um, but yeah, mm. I'm I'm excited though to to dig into the show today. We've got we've got an open source video game to talk about, which is kind of a a rare animal in some ways. Um, Endless Sky is the name of the project in the game. And uh, I, I must admit, I am something of a gamer and I may have spent too many hours playing Endless Sky over the last couple of months uh, because of research purposes, of course. <laughs> uh, Dan, are you familiar with Endless Sky? Uh, are, are you a gamer at all? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I am, uh, I'm not as much of a gamer as I was um many years ago but um i've actually uh, like much like you been using the excuse of like important work <laughs> research recently so i've been playing endless sky this week um for uh, many hours of course M- very important research got to make sure you do it properly and thoroughly <laughs> um, so that's been a great excuse uh, yeah also it's it's a really interesting game as you say open source gaming um not something you see a lot so it'll be great to uh, to talk a bit more about that Yes, and we'll have Jonathan Steck to join us here in just a few minutes. Uh, Before we do that, though, I have an important announcement to read. Because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Linode. Managing your complex cloud infrastructure shouldn't be hard. Linode believes in cloud computing for all. Simplify your cloud infrastructure with Linode's Linux virtual machines and develop, deploy, and scale your modern applications faster and easier. 
Why do over 800,000 developers choose Linode? Well, they've got an intuitive cloud manager and a full-featured API. Linode has data centers around the world with the same simple and consistent pricing regardless of the location. Choose the data center nearest to you to get the best latency and connection speeds. They have award-winning customer support. That's 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year with no tiers or handoffs regardless of your plan size. That means when you call in, you get somebody competent right away, not just a desk jockey. Think of all the things you can do. You can host a website or build your app. You can store or backup media. You can easily launch or enrich your developer applications, hosted services, websites, artificial intelligence and machine learning workloads, gaming services, or continuous integration environments. Launch and scale in the cloud with their virtual machines. You can choose shared and dedicated compute instances, or you can use your $100 in credit on S3-compatible object storage, managed Kubernetes, and more. Be sure to check out Linode's new YouTube channel for video tutorials, security tips, and more. That's at youtube.com slash Linode. Bryce Adams from Metric says, From the start, we were looking for a partner, not a provider. Some of the large providers see us only as a transaction. Linode is the kind of partner that will be with us from the start, today, and beyond. We also want to congratulate Linode for their multiple Stevie Award wins. Their sales and customer service were awarded for excellence for the third consecutive year. Simplify your infrastructure and cut your cloud bills in half with Linode's Linux virtual machines. Whether you're developing a personal project or managing larger workloads, you deserve a simple, affordable, and accessible cloud computing solution. Get started on Linode today with $100 in free credit for listeners of Floss Weekly. You can find all the details at linode.com slash floss. Not at your desktop? Simply text TWIT to 474747 to get your free credit. Linode.com slash floss and click on the Create Free Account button to get started. If it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. And we thank Linode for their sponsorship. All right, Mr. Jonathan Steck, let's talk about Endless Sky. Um, first off, welcome to the show. How are you today, sir? Thank you for having me. Pretty good. All right. And where are you speaking to us from, if we may ask? Pennsylvania. Ah, many, many, many years ago, I used to live in Pennsylvania. Where, if you don't mind, you can, you can keep your exact location secret if you, if you would like to. But yeah. whereabouts in Pennsylvania are you at? Um... Not Harrisburg, not Philly, not Pittsburgh. So <laughs> okay, fair, fair <laughs> not, enough. Not the the major fair. cities. We'll say that. Yes, I, I definitely understand the idea of not wanting to uh, broadcast your exact location to to the entire internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but we're not here to talk about that sort of thing. We're here to talk about endless sky. Uh, give us give us kind of the thirty thousand foot view. Tell us about uh, what endless sky is and how you got involved with it. All right, so on a, I guess, very far-out view, Endless Sky is a top-down space adventure game with choose-your-own-adventure elements to it. And, yeah, I'd, I'd basically say that. So in, in terms of how I got involved in it, and I, I got involved in it because I was browsing Steam, and Steam, if you don't know, is a, a video game platform uh, for... For PC mostly and in Mac as well, I believe. But on there, you there's a um, ah, I'm not too good at this. Where what? <laughs> Let's start over. So endless sky, top down <laughs> space adventure game <laughs> with text based uh, choose your own adventure elements to it. I found it on Steam back in 2015, I believe it was 2016, I think maybe because it was it was free. It was free and. Whenever, when you're like me, you're a, uh, a college student. At the time, I was a high school student. You don't have a lot of money. You see a free game. It's in a genre you like. It's like, yeah, maybe let me try this out. So like you guys, I spent many, many hours playing Endless Guy when I first found it. And it, it, it hooked me basically day one. I was spending maybe a bit too much time playing it at first. And at a certain point, I was like, uh, this, this is pretty interesting. Let me see what other people are saying about it. So I went to the community forums on Steam, and I was looking around, and I saw that people were talking about a, a campaign, a story for this game. And I'm like, wait, there's a story for this game? Because <laughs> as far as I had played, I didn't like interact with any story whatsoever outside of what you might find in the descriptions for planets. So I, I posted a thread. I was like, hey, how do I get to the story? How do I start the story? And somebody's like, oh, go down south and click the spaceport button. 
And that that spaceport button on the the landing panel UI, that's something I just had never clicked because as far as I could tell, it didn't really do anything aside from give you a different description for the planet. So I was like, why would I ever click this? But uh, it turns out it's very important for finding the story of the game. So I went down south um, in the game, started click on the spaceport, and ended up starting the campaign with... Uh, much stronger ships than were intended at the time, given that I was spending a lot of time not doing the story before that point. So, hmm. and got got interested, played the story, really loved it. And I was like, well, what more can I do after I finish the story? So I found out that the game is highly moddable. And I was like, well, mm-hmm. I can probably make my own mods, so why not? And the, the documentation for the, the plugins that you can create, it, it's very good documentation. So I was able to very easily follow along and figure out how to make my own stuff. And that's just what I did for maybe a month, just making my own things, posting them on Steam to get feedback from others, see what other people were making for their own plugins and playing those. And after a certain point, I was like, well, I, I, I found out at this point that this game is open source on GitHub. Um, b- before this point, I, I vaguely knew what open source uh, programs were, uh, but I'd never heard of GitHub, and I'm like, oh, this is pretty interesting. Well, if I'm making plugins for myself, why not just like start making things for for everyone? Get it actually merged into the game so that anybody who plays the game can enjoy it instead of just people who are finding my plugins. So nice. that's basically the the start of how I got involved. So you had heard of open source, but Endless Sky was kind of your gateway drug to really get involved. All right, hey, that that's that's really cool, um, and so I'm I'm curious. Well, let's see. Uh, we should probably talk about the game itself a little bit. Um, it's it's something like the old. I, this is before my time, but it's kind of like the old privateer game and some of those from way back in the day, isn't it? Yeah, I've heard. Um, I believe privateers come up as like a comparison, but the game that it's it's most directly. Uh, related to, I would say, is the Escape Velocity series. If anybody's played that from the uh, from Ambrosia Software, the and the reason is is because the creator of the game. So I'm not the creator of the game. I'm just a guy who kind of works on it, like I said. Um, mm-hmm. But the creator of the game, Michael Zonizer, the reason that he started making it is because he played the Escape Velocity series as I don't know if it was as a kid, but back like 20 years ago, a lot. And after so many years, he was he, he said he had like a bit of an itch to to play something like Escape Velocity. And he, he looked out, tried to find something that was similar, and the closest thing he could find was a, another open source game called Nave. That's N-A-V-E-V. And uh, <laughs> some of the people on the Discord server are going to freak out when I say that name. But um, <laughs> Nave is another game where it's open source and it's, it's um, inspired by the Escape Velocity series. But at the time that Michael found the game, or found, found Nave, Nave was kind of dead in the water. There wasn't really any development going on. And he was interested in, like, uh, working on his own Escape Velocity-type game. But since Nave wasn't there, he was like, well, maybe I could just make my own. So I believe in 2014 is when he started working on the game, at least from what we can tell from the uh, uh, some of the files on GitHub. But mm-hmm. that's when he started, and he was just working on it on his own. There's um, somebody in the credits, I, I think... Um, Orion Zonizer, so somebody related to him who helped him out with it, and some other people in there who I believe were probably friends that he reached out to or people he knew that could help him out with it. And then in 2015, he uploaded the everything that he had to GitHub. And from there, it kind of just started to slowly grow, and like I said, I found the game on Steam as well as many other people, and the reason was for that is that Steam had this uh, program called the Greenlight Program. And it was basically a way for game developers to submit their games and people could look at them and greenlight that to go on Steam. And luckily, Endless Sky was approved in that Greenlight Program and ended up being on Steam. And that's how uh, the, the first big jump in popularity started was when, uh, when it was uploaded to Steam. It's, it's kind of one of the few games one of the few open source games that have made it to Steam. That's not a very big list, is it? Uh, I don't believe so, no. No. Um, so the the original creator, uh, is he still involved with the project? Um, vaguely right now. So back in, I think, 2018, um, the commits from Michael on the repository 
really started to slow down, and we noticed it. There were less pull, uh, pull requests being reviewed. There was less commits. I was like, so what's going on? And then there was several a several month span of no commits, and people were kind of getting a little fed up with it. And I will say, at one point, we even thought of putting together a community fork of the game so we could just continue development on it because there were a lot of people at that point who were really interested in the development of this game, and we were willing to like up and, and fork the game if we if we needed to to continue de- development on it because uh, Michael kind of seemed MIA, but luckily. We reached out to him, and he did get back to us saying that things were getting very busy for him in his life. And and something I'll I'll say, this game is open source. It's free. It's completely a hobby project for everyone Mm -hmm. involved. So because of that, it couldn't be something that Michael worked on full time. And it it, it reached the point where he just couldn't really work on it all too much. And something he said was that he was spending most of his time reviewing uh, reviewing pull requests. And if the game increases in popularity, you're going to get more people wanted to contribute to it. You're going to get more pool quests. So those just started to pile up and it kind of started to eat away at his, his um, not really joy, but motivation to work on the game. And that's what part of what led to the decrease in commits. But when we reached out to him, he was like, okay, I noticed that I can't really work on the game, but I also noticed that you guys are really interested in working on it. So what he did was he added myself as well as two others, uh, Touch and Pointed Stick, as collaborators to the repository on GitHub. And basically since then, since late 2018, uh, us three have been the main ones basically maintaining the game and reviewing cool quests and contributing to it. And, and I'm curious, what, what license is Endless Sky uh, developed under that made the even the option of forking it possible? I believe it's uh, GPL version 3, if I have that correct. I believe it's in the in the README on the repository. I saw that that page had come up. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it it is GPL v three. I was looking. I had a look. Um, I don't know. They don't, we talked a bit about um, open source games and Steam and so on. There aren't a lot of. There certainly aren't a lot of GPL licensed uh, games that I know of. I mean, people will be screaming at me now. People who watch this or listen to this will be saying, what about this and what about that? And Of course, there are games out there that you load up on your Linux distribution or whatever that come with it, but they tend to be puzzle games, little things like, you know, copies of Solitaire and things like that. Um, I was really interested. The kind of scope of this game is, is amazing. Um, I, I'm feeling really old now because you, ta- you guys were talking about like 20 years ago being kids and stuff, and I, I feel really old now because I, I was thinking of um, Elite, which is what reminded me of all the old, pe- all the old people in, who were listening. Will go, oh, we remember that. So by, way back in the eighties, when I really was a little kid, um, we used to play a game called Elite, which was like this, it was like a privateer game and load it on tapes and stuff. But enough of my reminiscing about years gone by. Um, it did remind me a little bit of that. Um, one of the things I was kind of curious about is. The, you, obviously, you, it was interesting. You talked a bit about the um, development of it and um, the original developer and, and getting in touch with them. How many people are kind of actively involved in this? Did you have any idea of, of rough? I mean, obviously, rough figures of how big the community is. Well, in terms of the uh, the repository, I believe there's about a hundred and fifty people in total who have contributed to the game. Um, mm-hmm. But in terms of the the broader community. We have, I think, close to 3,000 people on the Discord server. Now, not every one of those is active, um, but in terms of like the active contributor to the game, I say there's a core of about um, 20 to 30 people. So, I actually reached out to a number of them uh, to get statements from them for this this presentation or this podcast. I was like, hey, they reached out mm-hmm. to us. Uh, or, and so I was like, yeah, let's get some people involved in this instead of just me. So I actually reached out to 18 people off the top of my head who I was like, hey, could you uh, answer a few questions for me? And we could get a statement for me to read off on show. Yeah, go for it. If you got some, some statements you want to read out, then yeah, yeah. Um, All right. Let's, let's hear what people have to say. Okay. So um, what I ended up asking to... Uh, to the people where I reached out to was three questions. And I guess we'll go through one by one, and after each one, we'll, we'll get some, some commentary on it. The first question I asked was, how you heard about the game and what interested you about it? The second one was, why you got involved in the game and, con- and contributing to it, and what it is exactly that you do. Then the third one was just general thoughts on working on or being involved in an open source project, the upsides or even downsides to that. So that was those were the three questions I asked them, and 
I think everybody except mm-hmm. for three people that I messaged uh, sent back uh, statements. The three that um, didn't send back statements said that they weren't really interested, but they, they were interested in the show. And probably uh, if they're not watching right now, they're probably going to watch the, the replay after the fact. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, I guess I'll, uh, I'll start with the, the first question. So how you heard about it? I, I won't go over exactly what people said because it was a lot of the same stuff and not too important. But generally, a lot of people heard it from either they saw the game was free on Steam and they're like, hey, a free game. It's about space. I like space. <laughs> let, me, let me download this. Um, if not that, a lot of people heard about it either through uh, Escape Velocity forums because Escape Velocity still has a community around it, even though it's a 20-plus-year-old game. There's still people who enjoy Escape Velocity and play the game. People heard about it through there. Mm. Or they heard about it from friends. Uh, girlfriends and wives were also mentioned as uh, people who, who who queued them in on the game. And then one of the big ones, too, has been a couple of bigger Twitch streamers or YouTubers who have found the game and talked about it. So the big one was uh, Quill18. A lot of people really started to join the Discord server after he streamed the game. I think he had several hundred people watching live and then the the videos he uploaded had several thousand people after the fact so he got a real big influx of people because of that as well as an influx of of, of people who now contribute to the game so that was uh it was pretty interesting that we were able to have that happen yeah and it's really good that um i mean you mentioned that like i think 2015 is when the uh, the github repo was was started and everything um so i mean uh, in a game's kind of life cycle, you're what six years in now. It's great that like things are still growing. It's actually it seems as though it's probably getting bigger uh, rather than shrinking at the. I mean, and hopefully we hope fingers crossed that people listening to this, watching this, will go and check it out as well, and maybe that can give it a bit of a boost as well. So, have you seen um, like new people coming in? Does that help to bring fresh blood to the development process and the kind of community? Definitely, definitely. Uh, one of the things that uh, is actually happening right now is uh, at, at a, we kind of have a bit too much right now because <laughs> I, I mentioned how there are three collaborators to the GitHub repository. And if, if you haven't messed with GitHub, a collaborator to a, to a repository is able to review pull requests and merge them if they've been approved. And since we only have three people working on that, and I will say uh, one of them isn't too active, um, he, he still works on the game, uh, Pointed Stick, but he isn't like super active in terms of uh, merging pool requests. So it's mainly me and Tehouch that look at things. But me and Tehouch are kind of differentiated in what exactly we work on. So Tehouch looks at more the, the engine code side of things. So uh, the game is written in C++, and you have the engine, and the engine is what reads the, the plugins. And this is something I'll actually mention. Um, given that Michael wanted to make the game very plug-in friendly and very easy to contribute to. That was actually one of his goals, was a game that's very easy to contribute to. He made it so that the game engine reads from text files, and those text files are formatted in a certain way to describe everything that actually shows up in the game. So that includes the systems, the ships, the things you put on the ships, all the missions, everything, basically. And with that we kind of have this differentiation in who works on the engine code and who works on these very easily editable text files. So Mm. we we kind of make the distinction of the source code and the content side. And I'm the one who mainly looks at the content side of things, and that is the biggest uh, part of the project in terms of people contributing to it because it's it's very easy to get into. It's um, the, The language is similar to Python in that it's all about indentations and new lines. And, and like I said, there's very good documentation on the, the wiki, so a lot of people will get into that. And, and, and we have a lot of people that uh, are so much so that there's, I think, 120-something open pool quests right now. And some of them have been sitting for quite a while, but we get to them when, we, when we're able to. So. Yeah, I mean, and you mentioned that everybody's doing this um Voluntarily, you know, uh, as a volunteer yep. as well. So you, I suppose people have to take that into account. Um, so are you the um, are you the authority on the story? Then are you the, are you the one who decides the direction of the story or helps to 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 craft that, or is that more, is that just everybody chipping in? Because I suppose with like a narrative and stuff, it could go off in all kinds of crazy dire- directions, which is great. But maybe somebody needs to have an overall eye on a big story that that they're trying to tell or something. Is that are you the guy for that then? 
Uh, I guess you could say that, yeah. For the most part, I will look at the stories that people contribute and like see how they fit into the broader picture. And it's like, hey, is this a good idea? Um, we have had some um, pool quests where like they're a good pool quest, it's a good story, but it doesn't really fit into the overall picture. So I've kind of had to say like, hey, this doesn't really fit. So it's great content. So if you want to work on something else, then go ahead. But for this specific pool quest, kind of going to need to... Uh, Leave that for now. Maybe make it a plugin, and 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 that's really the the good thing about the whole plugin system is even if your content doesn't get merged into the game, you can still make it an amazing plugin. Mm. So, um, but yeah, in terms of specific story points, there's different people who work on on different story points. So I won't get into too much detail on the story itself because I want people to play the mm. game and enjoy it and not be spoiled. Mm -hmm. But there are yeah. various factions in the game that each have their own storylines, and. There, right now, like one person can't work on all the storylines at once because there's just too many of them and not enough time in the data to work on all of them. So we kind of have certain people who kind of head up different story elements to the game. So one person who I guess I'll, I'll read their statement now is, is Zichaz. Mm. So Zichaz is the one who's focusing on the faction called the Remnant. So what he said was the Remnant were basically a blank slate. They proposed some interesting ideas, concepts, and styling, and that was all. When I talked about them, the general Im impression was that they were something cool but ultimately irrelevant and not something anybody was really interested in in terms of actually going to them in the game. Every other faction had at least one and sometimes several people trying to build up their respective storylines, but the remnant seemed pretty much abandoned in their own little corner of the universe. So he said that that's why he got uh, involved in working on the, the game is he saw that there was this this faction that wasn't really being worked on. And what he said was basically I had the luck of um, finding a faction that was not only interesting to him, but something that also wasn't really being developed. So it was completely open for him to, to look into. So he's the one who kind of heads up the development on that faction. And another person is uh, Araki, who he, he's the one who's kind of heading up the development on the Coalition, which is another faction in the game. And, and there's, mm. there's several factions and whatnot that the people look into. So... Excellent. That is that is very cool. I mean, it's nice that people can um, kind of take ownership of, of their own little bits as well. And as you said, the plugin thing is very cool for that because they can, um, you know, they can branch out into their own plugin and do something different. Um, I was a bit curious about the. Um, I mean, there's a lot of text in the game, obviously, because it's 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 got the old school adventure game kind of element. Um, do you have any kind of internationalization? You know, could I read it in Spanish or French or anything else? Or is that something that you might want to do in future? I imagine with that much text, it's quite a challenge. So translations are something that is is planned. Um, there's actually some. Uh, so we're in like the mid. Uh, four-digit uh, numbers for issues and pull requests. But there are some, like, low triple-digit issues that have been posted years and years ago that are like, hey, this game is great, but can I translate it to Chinese or Spanish or, or some other language? But right now, unfortunately, the game doesn't really support translations. The one big point is that there's the game only renders text that is ASCII. We don't have, like, UTF-8 support. So any sort of character that really doesn't easily fit into English, you, you, it just won't render properly in the game. So that's, that's the big hurdle to translations right now. But we have been mm. making work towards actually having translations in the game. There is somebody who has been working on updating the, the text rendering to support UTF-8 characters. And I believe at this moment that is more or less done. But one of the issues with that um, is that we need to add a new library or, or some new libraries to the compilation progress or pro uh, process and for when you launch the game some new dlls and the only person who can actually update those is michael so i talked about how at this point it's mainly me and the two other contributors or collaborators that are really updating the game but we still need michael for releases specifically to steam so i'm the game's on steam and that's really one of the big outlets for the game right now so we need to be able to update that but since Michael is the only one who can do that right now, there is still that uh, that roadblock of of making new release new releases. So right now we're actually we've actually been waiting for Michael to push the latest release for uh, about a month now, and kind of would have been nice to have it like just before this uh, this podcast. But like, hey, this is a new update, go play it. But unfortunately, that's just mm -hmm. not not possible right now. 
<laughs> so watch for it. It's coming soon, TM. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, I want to jump next into talking more about kind of the, the content creation and how that works in open source. Uh, but before we do that, I've got an announcement to read, and that is that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Technology Powers X, an original podcast by Dell Technologies. Each episode of Technology Powers X focuses on a different industry and goes behind the scenes to help you understand how technology is reshaping business everywhere. I just recently checked out their recent episode about the smart home. It was interesting. It looked at uh, what we would do on a hobby level and then what a commercial entity would do on a much larger level and uh, kind of made some parallels and then talked about the technology behind it. Uh, a recent episode featured researchers who are studying the architecture of the human brain in an effort to develop more versatile AI models. Another episode explores the world of professional esports, featuring a behind-the-scenes look at Team Liquid and their star CSGO player, Alige. And one episode talks all about vertical farming and how innovative new tech can change where our food comes from and how this may be the future of sustainably feeding 21st century populations. Technology Powers X is hosted by Danielle Applestone, a hardware engineer and entrepreneur. If you're a pet lover, check out episode 14, The Best Partners for Pets. And we have a clip of it for you. Yet today, technology plays a growing role, not just in happy reunions, but as an invaluable tool to America's animal welfare workers. Search for Technology Powers X anywhere you listen to podcasts and download each episode today. That's Technology Powers X. Download today. And we thank Technology Powers X for their sponsorship of Floss Weekly. All right, Jonathan, there's... Well, one of the things that sets <clears throat> sets um, Endless Sky apart is that it's a single-player game. <clears throat> and I, I'm, it's interesting to me that there, is, there, there, are, there are open source games out there. Uh, in fact, somebody in the chat mentioned uh, Zonotic and uh, Tuxcart is a couple that they're familiar with. And th one of the things that I find so interesting is that those are generally multiplayer games without a whole lot of storyline to them, whereas Endless Sky is a single-player experience, and it's very storyline-rich once you get into the missions. And I'm, I'm just curious of your thoughts about kind of this wider issue in open source that, well, to put it simply, we have a lot of programmers, but we don't necessarily have open source content creators. What, what do you think about that? I mean, uh, yeah, I suppose that is a, a bit of a problem. And uh, kind of at first, it was the same on, on our end and Endless Sky. When things, when I first started to get into the project, there was really not many other people who were working on, on big storylines or anything. It was mainly like, hey, here's one storyline I made or something like that. But most of the pull quests were like, hey, here's a bug fix or here's a new mechanic to the engine that I want to add. And it wasn't really too much... Uh, people working on creating content. Now, as time has gone on, that's kind of flipped where now we have a lot more people working on content than we do have people working on uh, changes to the engine. But uh, given that I did see that like very early on in the game, that there weren't too many people uh, that were really big on, on content creation, I guess, yeah, it kind of sounds like that would be an issue in the, in the wider open source community, I guess you could say. I guess we're just lucky that we've kind of attracted a lot of people who are interested in content creation. Oh, that's interesting. So where do so the the game is it's top down, it's two D. So there's not like uh, there's not like three D modeling that goes into it, but there is a bunch of artwork. Well, um, there's what's that? Go ahead. I was just going to say, well, there is actually three uh, D modeling involved. So you, you mentioned the, the artwork side of things. Um, all the artwork, well, not all of it, but a lot of the artwork is actually done in Blender. We have um, so Michael uh, when he first started working on the game. Um, he saw that Blender was this free, uh, open source 3D modeling software. He was like, uh, maybe I should use this. Um, and what he, what he wanted to do was use tools that anybody could use. And that, and that was actually part of the, the process of making the game very easy to contribute to. Because not only is it easy to make plugins to the game, but it's also easy to use the same tools that the Michael used to actually develop the game. So the ships and the outfits, which are the things that you put in the ships to make them actually run, those are all 3D modeled. And Michael was the one who mainly worked on that early on, but and as time has gone on, he's gotten a lot better at it. But a lot of the older models, they were, they were, they were very noticeably less detailed than a lot of the newer stuff. So we now actually have a number of other people who 
I've gotten involved and are doing a lot of modeling. The one big one is is Becca Bunny. He is like a a master 3D modeler, I would say. He does some amazing artwork for the game at this point. And a lot of the new stuff that you see um, in any new update is is from him. And then do you guys <clears throat> do you guys also pull in um, like stock uh, in, in some when you go to some planets in the game, uh, you'll get like a background photo or a background uh, image that kind of represents what the planet is supposed to look like. Um, are those generally created specifically for the game or a lot of those kind of stock images that just happen to be uh, licensed in a way that's permissive enough for the game to use them? I believe that like 99% of those are stock images that are, have a license that we're able to use. I think maybe there's one or actually there was one person who they were able to get access to this um, open license collection of models that looked really fitting for like a space station. So they actually went into Blender and modeled a bunch of space station images and they, they rendered them from Blender and those are now the the images that we use for a lot of the stations in the game that you can land on. But for the most part, everything else is pulled from from stock images and some of them are from NASA, some of them are from uh, just random stock image websites, but, but yeah, mostly those are just things that we find. Uh, we we did have a question from uh, from our chat room from Jojo Dancer. Uh, he he asked first about what language the game was developed in. I believe we said that was C plus plus. But then he's, yes. he's curious about uh, what what compiler is used to make the official versions of the game. And then is there uh, documentation as to what the development rules are, the do's and don'ts? And I, I believe he means like a a code style guide and maybe even a community guide. You want to speak to those things? Yeah. So in terms of the actual compilation of the game. It's um, available on Linux, Mac, and on Windows. So the Windows compiler that we use is CodeBlocks. The Mac compiler is Xcode. And then Linux, I think you can just like run a command line or something and it'll compile it for you. But um, yeah, those are the, the compilers that we use. We do have a git ignore that will ignore files from uh, some other um, popular C++ IDEs you're able to compile the game with, but we don't directly support those, largely because um, dealing with three different platforms and multiple different um, compilers is already a bit of a hassle, so we don't really want to tack on too many more uh, compilers that we have to deal with on top of that. But it, since it is all open source and everything, you can very easily compile it in whatever other uh, IDE that you want to if you hook it up correctly. And um, the second question was the code style. We, we do have a, a code style or a code guidelines file that Michael set up, and that is available on the, the website for the game, um, endlessguy.github.io. And that just shows the, that is the, the do's and don'ts file in terms of the C++ side of things, the, the source code changes. But currently, we don't have any sort of style guide for the data files. There are some guidelines that we will discuss, like if you open a pull request and you have some issues, I'll point out like, hey, this doesn't match the style we use, here's the style. But that is actually a currently open issue to create some sort of style guide for the the data side of things, the content side of things. If uh, if someone was interested in the game, you know, fell in love with it, like I think it sounds like Dan and I have, uh, and really wanted to get involved, um, I, I, I think... Jojo was probably going to be uh, on the coding side of it. Uh, where would be the best place to start? What are the um, what are the places to go to, and, and what are the things that someone could start working on? Well, off the top of my head, my head, I can't really point to anything specific that's like, "Hey, here's a really good issue for a first timer." But um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that what you could do is go to the the Discord server. So once you've downloaded the game, when you when you're when you're on the main menu on the left side, the credits will scroll. Near the top of the credits, like basically at the top, is the link to the Discord server. So you can use that and hop onto the Discord server. And we have several rooms in the Discord server that are dedicated to content creation. There's one main room, and then there's a, um, a separate room that's mainly dedicated toward the, the source code side of things. And you can always hop in there and be like, hey, is there anything in specific that anybody wants to wants to look at? Because there's people who are always like, hey, I've got this idea and that idea. And 
we don't we have, we have more ideas than we have people who can work on the ideas. So if anybody is interested in in contributing, they can always hop in the Discord server and be like, "Hey, is there anything I can work on?" And I'm sure somebody will be like, "Yeah, I can work on this." Speaking speaking of which, this is this is something interesting. There's an old like from 2016, an old uh, I think it's a feature request or a bug report. Uh, someone wanted to know: Is Endless Sky ever coming to Android? <laughs> and I'm, I'm curious <laughs> if you guys ever tossed around the idea of, of uh, porting it yeah. to mobile platforms and maybe having a revenue stream there. I mean, yeah, there's there's been a couple of uh, issues like that. Like, hey, can we get an iOS version? Can we get an Android version? There was even one that was like, hey, can we get a Switch version on like a jailbroken Switch or something <laughs> like that? And like, but uh, <laughs> but like I, like I said, there's kind of already a bit of a hassle in working on three platforms already, and there's there's really no plans to to port the game to other platforms. But I I will say like this is the uh, one of the good things about open source. All the source code's there for you to to port over to. Whatever you want to, if you want, if you have the the knowledge to, there have been attempts in the past, I believe, to create a mobile version of the game, but whoever was working on that, I don't think they finished anything because I haven't heard of it. But if you go digging, you will find people starting work on that type of thing. So I'm sure that if you're really interested in having a mobile version of the game, then you could uh, find what they started with and just go from there. <laughs> we found some footage of it. Um, just to be clear, that is just uh, that is just the game on a desktop, not not some uh, in process mobile version. Um, now I'm I'm curious. We've we've talked about this a little bit. Um, the the actual organization of the developers of Endless Sky seems uh, a little loose. Uh, there's not like any sort of uh, there's not any sort of foundation or is there even a company uh, behind Endless Sky? Is is there a uh, you know, is there a legal entity that gets put on the documentation somewhere, or or is it just really a loose group of developers? No, nah, no, no sort of uh, company or corporation behind us or anything. It's, it is really just a, a loose group of people who are interested in working on it. Now, I'm curious: has there been a push to to make that uh, more structured and maybe try to do something to make money off of it? Well, in terms of um, making money off of things. Uh, part of the game, or part of the reason the game is free is because it is open source, and Michael really wanted to have that open source, very easily uh, moddable situation, but he also didn't want to have to deal with like receiving money for the game off of Steam, but other people are contributing to it, so maybe there's some reason why people would be like, hey, I need a cut of this money. But um, <laughs> w- one thing of note is that we don't take donations. So that that's kind of a precedent that Michael set, where he wasn't really interested in taking donations. There's two big reasons for that. The first one was this game was just a hobby for him from the start, and he didn't want to turn it into a second job. And he felt that if he were to take donations, that would get into the territory of turning this into a second job. And the second reason was, I believe he's mentioned that the uh, the contract that he has for the company that he works at has some sort of stipulation where he can't be making money on the side in, in any sort of computer science or like software engineering situation. Uh, they basically want exclusivity um, from him in terms of the work he does for the company. So that's like the, the legal reason why he didn't take donations, but the, um, the moral reason was he didn't want to have to make it a second job. And since since uh, he really started that, that precedent, there hasn't been any real major push to accept donations. There was a point where I was like, hey, maybe I could set up some sort of donation page on like Patreon or Subscribestar or something, and people could donate just to me in terms of my development on the game. But I ultimately decided to not end up doing that, partially because I do agree with the idea of not really turning this into a job. And there's also the fact that I'm, I'm just one among many. I, I do a lot of work, but I don't want to like raise myself above what other people are doing. And I felt that if I were to be taking money for the game in terms of donations, that that would kind of be getting into a situation of me raising myself above everybody else. So ultimately decided not to do that and nobody else has really uh, ventured into that. We we have a, we have a comment from the chat room. Retcon5 says to tell you that he has a bunch of NFTs that he's willing to donate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um... That's the big thing. Uh, like like I it? said, uh, not really, not really taking donations. If you if you want to support the project, then contribute to it. If if you can't contribute, then uh, do some free advertising. Word of mouth. Hmm. Sure, Dan, yeah, did you did you really, want to jump uh, in with something? 
Yeah, that's uh, that's a, it's really interesting the stuff you're talking about there. I was thinking about um, running costs. I mean, you may have mentioned this already, but I mean, I know because it's not you're not hosting the game. It, it's not like a multiplayer game that needs servers that are up that need to be hosted and paid for and stuff. Are there running costs for the project or anything that need to be kept kept going? So, in terms of the game itself. There were no costs whatsoever in terms of running this. Since it's all hosted on GitHub, that's, that's free. We don't need to pay for that. Um, but the assets for the game are stored on Google Drive. And I don't mm. know if the assets for everything... So, so that's the, the Blender files. That's um, GIMP files. So we use GIMP for post-processing. That is... Um, I don't know if there's any like Audacity files in there, but I, I know some people have used Audacity to do audio editing. But that's where we keep all the assets is on a Google Drive folder. I don't know if that exceeds the the limit that Google Drive puts on, um, hmm. like a, a free account. Um, but if that if that has exceeded the limit, Michael is the one who actually maintains that uh, GitHub folder. I mean, not GitHub, that Google Drive folder. So if there are any costs, that's on his side, and I don't know about any of that. But um, outside of the game itself, we do have um, one guy, MCO, who he uh, he described himself as basically the the closest thing to a DevOps role that we have um, working mm -hmm. on the game. He does a lot of um, CD and CI stuff, and he's working on creating a launcher for the game that is currently functional. Not, not the prettiest, I'll say, but it's currently functional, and it includes the ability to pull down a continuous build from GitHub. So that continuous build is everything from the latest commit. So we only do releases every so many months, but the continuous build does allow you to get the latest stuff immediately without having to compile it yourself. And something that MCO also has worked on is a, a custom bot for the Discord server that we have, and that bot does require hosting, and he does need to pay for that, and we have actually posted the link on Discord saying, like, hey, he needs to, to spend um, money to host this, so if anybody wants to donate for that, then they can. So I guess I, I said earlier there were, aren't really any donations. I guess that's the one exception where MCO is receiving donations for mm -hmm. being able to host the bot for the Discord server. And that bot includes some um, various commands that you can type in chat, and it'll pull up uh, data for the game. So it's basically like a, a content creation tool that we have for the Discord server that he, he uh, maintains. That's very, very cool. I like that. Um, we have a, another question from IRC. Um, the Andromedan uh, has <laughs> asked a question. It says, the, uh, the, big question for me, uh, when it, the big question when it comes to a project is, what graphical toolkit is used? <laughs> so there we go. They want to know. Uh, we've had language. We've had all kinds of other things. What graphical toolkit? You mentioned Blender. Is that, is that the answer? Um, graphical toolkit. I guess Blender would... Uh be included in that. Yeah, Blender, and then we also use GIMP um, for other image processing. But um, graphical toolkit, if you talk about the libraries we use, it's in OpenGL. And the uh, okay. the minimum requirement is, I think, OpenGL 3.0 or higher. Um, people mm. have been able to like hack the game to run in OpenGL 2.0, but I don't think we're planning on lowering the requirements, mostly because like there are very few people who don't have OpenGL 3.0 or higher, and um, Michael was like, I was able to get everything running on OpenGL 3.0. I don't want to like reduce the requirements that end up breaking something for somebody. So, mm. and in terms of, of getting things running and so on, um, I we were talking a bit about it in the chat there. Um, it works really well. I didn't go through Steam. I, I got the app image off the um, the Git, GitHub repo and just ran it on my Linux desktop, and it it works uh, works great. And I'm sure you know people can grab it on Mac or, or Windows in the same kind of way. Um, going back to graphics, though, Jonathan asked about this a little bit before, which was interesting about the the photos that you get when you visit a, a planet or, or so on. You get these background photos. There's a lot of pictures of people on there as well. So uh, you mentioned the spaceport, which I have to admit I was a bit confused by as well at first because when you click it, it often just brings up a picture of a person who has a job title. Yeah, that just yeah. gives you a random random quote or something. Uh, are any of those people like community members or is that all just stock stuff? Because I, I just was tickled by the idea that you could get pictures of maybe some of the community members in there somehow. Mm. No, nah, th those aren't uh, pictures of community members. Those are stock images too. But it's funny that you mentioned that because um, that was a, those portraits were an experimental addition to the game because every, every so often we'll add something that's like, hey, let's add this in, have this out for a release or, or a few releases, get feedback on it, and then 
if feedback is negative, we'll remove it. If it's positive, we'll keep it in. And those images are actually something we've received a bit of negative feedback on. And in the next release, those portrait images will actually be gone because part of the part of the issues with those is not only the fact that you don't really see people's faces anywhere else in the game. So it's kind of weird that when you go to the spaceport, you see like a random person that pops up. But there's also hmm. the fact that um, so that system that you're looking at, that, that's called the spaceport news system. Whenever you click on the spaceport, you'll get some sort of dialogue pop up that says like, hey, here's something that's going on or you'll, you'll talk to somebody and, or they'll say, just say something to you. Um, that, that was added to like spice up the spaceport a bit. So it, it seems like something you want to actually go to because I kind of talked about how I never clicked on the spaceport. That was a, something we added to give you more of a reason to click on the spaceport and then hopefully stumble <laughs> upon the story. But um, yeah, we want to th – that currently only exists – well, currently, as in in the latest release, that only exists in human space and anywhere else that humans might be. So there, there are some humans in um, in non-human space. Um, a bit of a spoiler, mm. but um, that the reason it is because we we have the images for for people, but there are images in the the game files for some of the alien races, but they're based off of animals. So like, you get a picture of a squirrel or an owl. And we thought that was really, really tacky to use for the uh, the images for the aliens. And and part of what we also want to have is use your imagination. We give you a description of the aliens. Use your imagination to fill in the rest. We don't want to have to give you an image to say like, hey, here's exactly what the, the aliens look like. So with the negative feedback from the, the human images and the fact that it would be difficult to have alien images without really ruining the... Uh, imagination of it we decided to remove those portrait images so the the ability to add them is still available to plugins but in terms mm. of the vanilla game those aren't going to be in the game um come the next update oh that is that well that is interesting um i suppose you're right because one of the advent one of the great things about the old school kind of text adventure games much like reading a book or any of these things is that you're creating the characters in your own mind and it would be different to each person um you mentioned that on the spaceport side of it i the reason i learned about the spaceport was because i i did there's a kind of a thing that leads you in if you're a new player where you kind of meet a character early on i think it's called james who says you know do you do yep. you want me to show you the ropes kind of thing i did that and followed him you know let him teach me all about it and one of the things he did say in the little bit of text was make sure to check the spaceport in everywhere you land you never know who you'll run into that was the only reason I managed to look at it, but it was because I followed the, the little text thing. But in my mind, I have an image of what that character would look like just from the text description, which is which is a, a, mm -hmm. an awesome way of doing it. Um, yeah, so um, I was curious about... Um, so you talked a bit about mobile versions and other things, which we won't get into because it, it does already run in a lot of places. Um, how about... I mentioned about installing it and so on. Um, is it difficult targeting multiple platforms? Does that make things more difficult? Or is that is that something that's already working? Because it sounds like you're using an engine that you're writing yourself, yourselves and, and building a lot of this from the ground up. So does it make more of a challenge to say, oh, we need to tweak this for the Windows version, it doesn't work in that, and it works okay in the Linux version, or do things generally marry up okay? So for the most part, things run fine on all the platforms uh, no matter what. Um, but every so often we get a bug that pops up on only one platform. Um, and it's usually the fault of um, just some quirk with whatever OS it is. It's like, hey, Windows likes this specific thing and Mac likes that specific thing. So uh, it, we're usually able to uh, iron those out um, without too much difficulty. But um, the, the one big thing I'll say with working on multiple platforms, specifically working with um, with Mac, is how Apple really doesn't like uh, open source stuff too much. They really like their proprietary software. So in uh, Apple has already said that they are going to um, deprecate support for OpenGL. And when that happens, um, we either need to port the game to use the metal renderer instead of OpenGL or just drop support for Mac altogether. And we're kind of leaning more toward dropping support whenever that does happen. And um, one of the other issues, too, is that we don't have too many people who develop on Mac. And because of that, um, so like I said, how Michael is the one who he sets up the, um, the release for Steam. He builds the game on an older version of um, Mac OS, I believe. And that allows it to run on 
any of the newer versions after that. But the continuous deployment stuff that we have only runs on the latest version of Mac. So you have to have the latest version of Mac to run the continuous development build. But if you, uh, if we somehow had somebody with like an older Mac, then they would be able to compile it. Um, aside from just Michael, but we don't. So because of that, there's a bit of issue with uh, with the Mac side of things. But otherwise, it's it's not too much of an issue to mess with these three platforms. We kind of already have it all set up. Once once support for Mac gets dropped, there's always the option of people being able to run the game in. Uh, let's see, Parallels is one of the big big solutions, uh, and then I think. Uh, uh, no, I suppose I, I was going to say Wine is an option too, but I don't think Wine really runs on Mac these days. I don't think that's something that's ever ever gotten off the off the ground. But there's still virtualization. It's not like uh, it's not like this is an extremely graphics heavy game, uh, as, nah. you know, compared to like an FPS or something. So it's it's not like Mac users are going to be totally shut out. So, yeah, yeah. And speaking of which, we actually have somebody who got the game to run in a browser. So I, I forget the, the exact link to the website. Let me see if I can, I can pull it up. But somebody got the game to run in the browser, and that also works on Mac. So if, if, if you have a browser, which I'm sure you do, um, I imagine you would be able to, uh, to run that. Let me, uh, let me see. Play-endless-sky.com. So oh that's the, the browser version that somebody made. Um, so it, that's awesome. I suppose that we can uh, continue working on that if, uh, if we have a Dropmax support. That is great. That <laughs> I pulled it, it off. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> that is excellent. I'm, I'm, it never ceases to amaze me what community members come up with and the crazy ideas that they pull off. That is great. Yeah, that, that wasn't even something that I had thought of doing, but somebody was like, hey, I want to make a, a browser version of the game, so they did. And as you can see, it's, it says Endless Web. The, the main version of the game says Endless Sky. So this is like a fork of the game that we don't directly support, but it is something that somebody has worked on. So it that, has their own, little, that, their own little changes to it. That is great. Um, all right, so I... I it, the thought occurred to me earlier, and I wanted to make sure and ask you about it. You said that a lot of the uh, a lot of the source for the graphics for the game is hosted in a Google Drive somewhere. Um, uh, you guys, please tell me, do have an official backup, an official fork of that in case <laughs> that particular Google Drive goes offline and whoever yeah, owns yeah. it uh, is unreachable? Yes. <laughs> so yeah, so. Like I said, Michael is the one who has control of that, and given that, he's the only one who can add to it. But since he's kind of um, not really too involved right now, it's not the most up-to-date. So we do actually have somebody who set up a repository on GitHub to also host the uh, the assets. And that isn't up-to-date too much either, but we are keeping track of where all the assets are because part of the pull request process is if you add new assets, you need to link those assets in the pull request so that we can actually grab those. So at some point, we, we're going to go through all the pull requests that have added new assets recently, grab all the assets, and then probably upload those to, to that uh, GitHub repository. One of, the, one of the things that we always talk about in Open Source Project is the, the bus factor. You know, is there, is there one person in the project that if he gets, you know, God forbid, run over by a bus tomorrow, is, he going to, is that going to kill the project or are there things in place that uh, will continue it on? And it's, it, it sounds like it's interesting, the fact that you've got a, the guy that originally started it is kind of taking a sabbatical from the project in some ways, has forced you guys to think through that process ahead of time. Yep. Yeah, the, the, uh, the term or the phrase bus factor came up a lot when, uh, when Michael was kind of uh, missing in 2018. So yeah, we, aren't, we aren't completely out of the woods of not needing him, but we are moving closer to it. So not that we don't want him around, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I think everybody that's ever worked on a collaborative project understands kind of that, that concept. Um, all right, we are, we are running very quickly to the end of the show. And so uh, I'm going to ask you a difficult question, and that is, is there anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't ask you about? Uh, I had a file that I pulled up. <laughs> I wrote down a lot of a lot of things um, just to like prepare this, and uh, uh, I think for the most part, I uh, I got to more or less everything. 
yeah, there's there's nothing in particular that I would say uh, we didn't hit on. So. All right. Uh, and then the, the next question is something of a joke, and that is, when do you guys plan to add Bitcoin to Endless Sky? Um, <laughs> around about 2050, probably. Okay. <laughs> That sounds perfect. Um, and, and then the last two questions are, um, what is your favorite text editor and scripting language? In terms of text editor, I use Notepad++ for basically everything. So um, something that, or actually, um, not a question, uh, Just something just came to my mind. Not a question that I wish you Good. would have asked, but something that I want to say. So I'm only 21. Um, I'm currently in college. And I am in college for computer software um, or for, for computer science. I'm looking to be a software engineer. And I will say that what, one of the major deciding factors to me going into software engineering, instead of one of my other interests, which probably would have been like civil engineering, mechanical engineering, was Endless Sky. So me getting involved in Endless Sky back in high school, because like I said, it was 2016, 2015 that I got involved in this. Um, that, I, I was still in high school at the time. That was basically one of the deciding factors to me, uh, actually becoming a uh, computer science uh, major. But uh, I, I, I kind of got off track there. But no, yeah, Notepad++ in terms of the text editor. Um, the, the reason it came to mind is because I was going to say that even in college, like if we're given like an IDE that we're supposed to use in the syllabus, I'm like, now let me just do everything in Notepad++ and I'll compile it in IDE <laughs> later. But um, in terms of scripting language, um, I kind of jokingly, I think that the, the, the language that the plugins are written in for Endless Sky, I think that qualifies as a scripting language, so that might count. <laughs> but if not that, then I would say Lua, because um, okay. I do, I've done a bit of Lua uh, scripting in the past, and I'm looking into this summer really digging my claws into learning Lua, because um, I actually have some friends that uh, they develop games on Roblox, and Roblox, you, you script games in Lua. So we're looking to do something crazy over there. But that, that's, that's completely unrelated to this. <laughs> You're not planning to port mm -hmm. uh, Endless Sky over to, to, to that platform? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> oh, well. All right, Mr. Jonathan Steck, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. Uh, the hour, thank as it normally does, is, yeah, it's flown by, and uh, I'm sure we could go for another hour asking you and talking about the game. Uh, but thank you so much for being here. Thanks for All right. Me. All right. Uh, Mr. Dan, what do you think, sir? I had, uh, really interesting uh, stuff. It was great to hear from Jonathan and, and really good to hear that this is what got him into uh, software as well and, and doing computer science. So, I mean, it's it's a great thing to, to hear. Um, I've got to say, I mean, I, I really do like this game. One, I've got a laptop right here uh, next to me that... Um, has the game running on it that I've actually closed. I've closed the lid, put it to sleep, because I thought, oh, I could, you know, have it open and, you know, so I could show stuff maybe during the, the show. But I, I also I also knew that I would be sat here just going, oh, I just need to drop some passengers off at so and so and pick up a bit of cargo here, and and then I'd totally just lose, you know, I'd probably lose, not lose interest in the show, but I'd end up getting so distracted that I wouldn't be paying attention to the show. Um, so yeah, please try the game out. Um, it is quite addictive, so you have been warned. But yeah. Really Really great stuff, and uh, it's a really fun game as well. Yeah, super, super interesting to hear that they've done so well with with getting more than just programmers involved in the game. And I think, mm -hmm. I think maybe. I think maybe the key to their success is the fact that they were able to get on Steam. And, you know, their screenshots look good and the description of it looks good and it's for free. And so they develop, they, they get a lot of attention from that. And a lot of the attention they get is not necessarily the programmer type, but it's, it's, it's the type of person that would be really interested perhaps in uh, writing and writing the next mission or, or doing something like that. Yeah, and there's lots of really good reviews on Steam as well, which is cool. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's really, the game seems to be really popular. Uh, and as a platform to be on, you know, for, for gaming, I mean, other platforms are available, obviously. But um, Steam is, is, is one of the places where you're going to get attention. And uh, it's really nice to see them getting positive feedback over there. Mm -hmm. Yep, excellent. Well, 
that uh, that is about it for Endless Sky for this week. Uh, next week, uh, theoretically, Doc will be back, and he is talking with Jason Donafield of WireGuard fame. Uh, this will be the second time we've had Jason on the show. He's a he's a real neat and interesting guy as well. Uh, make sure and catch that. Um, and then the week after that, on the 28th, we're having a, another Jonathan, interestingly, Jonathan Riddle, talking about KDE Neon, which I believe that is a Linux distribution that's specifically a showcase for KDE. Um, hmm. Do you have anything, Dan, that you'd like to plug before we let you go? Um, well, uh, something that is relevant to, um, to to listeners of this show and viewers of this show is um, I'm a bit involved. I'm quite involved in the uh, the lug, the Linux user group scene in the UK. When I say involved, I, I don't do anything particularly fantastic. Don't, don't I can't take credit for for a lot of great stuff that happens. But um, uh, one of the interesting things. Uh, that's come out of the pandemic is we're doing these things online now, obviously, because we were forced to originally, but it means that people can join from other places and around the world. And the big news is that on the 28th of April, so a couple of weeks today, in fact, um, the uh, Wolverhampton Lug are having uh, hosting a, a meeting where they're going to have the creators of Rocky Linux, um, which is due to come out soon, quite a big story in the in the Linux world. Um, the uh, the two uh, creators of, of Rocky Linux are going to be on to talk about that and uh, a couple of hours of, of them giving a talk all about that. Um, if you want to know more about it, you can find uh, the information just by uh, searching on um, meetup, meetup.com. Uh, if you search for uh, Rocky Linux or uh, search for um, Wolverhampton Lug, Rocky Linux, um, and they're all hosted through Nova Lug as well, which is, you know, great cross, uh, cross, um, what's the word? Cross ocean, cross platform. I don't know, cross platform is <laughs> not the right word, but cross ocean collaboration going on there. Um, so yeah, people should check that out. Um, if you, It'll be on, it's on my Twitter and other places. If you go to danlynch.org I'll be tweeting about it and posting about it and stuff um, but it'd be nice to uh, see some people there if, if anyone's interested in hearing about Rocky Linux um, we'll put some um, you know we'll, they'll be we'll be able to speak to the people who are uh, who are actually making it so should be cool once uh, once the Rocky Linux distro actually has their 1.0 release or they probably won't call it 1.0 because it's it's a, a Mm. It's a replacement for CentOS, is what it is. Uh, we need to we need to see about getting a couple of their guys here on Floss Weekly. That'd be a, that'd be a good interview too. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Well, yeah. I I will plug the main thing that I have is a uh, Hackaday. Um, over at hackaday.com, uh, I write a security column. It goes live every Friday morning, uh, so make sure and check that out. And any other of the super interesting hacks you see over there at Hackaday. Uh, they are there's there's something of a synergy between uh, the the maker community that Hackaday represents and the open source community that we represent. We, we we really are, I think, two different sides of the same coin, the same the same creative urges and the same desire to share it just kind of working out in two different mediums. Uh, so I, I'm I'm always glad to be able to plug Hackaday and, uh, you know, occasionally floss weekly over at Hackaday. Uh, but go and make sure you check that out, especially Friday mornings. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for being here. It's uh, it's always fun to get to to be on the show with you. Uh, I appreciate you coming along. Uh, no problem. Thanks for having me. I'll see you in Hawaii next week or wherever we're going. <laughs> right. Sure. That's that's the plan. That's what we'll do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And thank you to the chat room. We got some questions from there. And for everyone watching, this is Floss Weekly. We'll see you next time. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands on Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday, that is, I like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop, it's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera it can be the simplest of things like leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder all of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up so subscribe to the show today that's twit.tv hop and i look forward to talking to you soon